The Jack Benny Program, presented by Lucky Strike. Scientific tests prove Lucky Strike is milder than any other principal brand of cigarette. Scientific tests prove Lucky Strike is milder than any other principal brand of cigarette. That fact is verified by an independent consulting laboratory with more than 15 years' experience in cigarette research. Based on our analytical findings, it is our opinion that Lucky Strike cigarettes are the mildest of the six major brands tested. And no wonder Lucky Strike cigarettes have been proved milder. For years, Lucky Strike has conducted a unique and vast program in research and quality controls and manufacturing methods. And today, tomorrow, always... L-S-M-F-T, L-S-M-F-T. Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. Fine, light, naturally mild tobacco that gives you smoothness and mildness with never a rough puff. So light up a Lucky and prove to yourself what scientific tests prove. Lucky Strike is milder than any other principal brand of cigarettes. Let your own taste and throat be the judge. For smoothness and mildness, there's never a rough puff in a Lucky Strike. The Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Barry Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, just four days from now, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences will present their annual awards. And when the winners are announced, Jack Benny, being a man of high ideals and noble character, will be the first to say... I was robbed. (laughs) And here he is, Jack Benny! (laughs) Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking, and Don, I'm glad you brought up the subject of the Academy Awards... Because Wait I... a minute, Jackson. Wait a minute. Temper, temper. Just hold your hair up a minute. <laughs> After all, where do you come off saying you was robbed? Huh? Well, the winners haven't even been announced yet. I know. And but... you haven't made a picture for five years. I know, I know. You've only got one show, too. <laughs> Dennis, go sit down. We oui, more Capitan. You can stop with that, too. Phil, when I said I was robbed, I was referring to last year. That's when they did the casting for the picture All the King's Men, and the director asked me if I'd like to compete for the lead. So I even went down to the studio. Well, don't feel bad about not getting the part, Jack. After all, Broderick Crawford is a wonderful actor. Broderick? Holy smoke, I thought it was Joan, and I wore my Charlie's Ant costume. <laughs> How do you like that? Well, Jack, weren't you embarrassed going out to the studio dressed up like Charlie Zan? Not at first, Don, but coming home on the streetcar, my bustle crept up and I looked like the hunchback of Notre Dame. (laughs) Anyway, that was my one chance to win an Academy Award. Well, don't take it too seriously, Jackson. Winning an award isn't important as long as you're doing the right thing. That's all that matters. What do you mean? Well, take the picture I just made, Wabash Avenue. Let Victor Mature and Betty Grable win the award. I'm happy knowing that I was aqueduct in the park. (laughs) Well, we're back to Francis, the mule. (laughs) Oh, I want to tell you something, Jackson. Seriously, those producers were smart to think of me. Phil, casting you was a natural. When they thought of making the picture, they thought of Chicago for the locale. When they thought of Chicago, they thought of Wabash Avenue. When they thought of an avenue, they thought of a street. When they thought of a street, they thought of a gutter. And any three-year-old could take it from there. (laughs) So, Phil, as far as the perfect casting is concerned, don't take it. Now, wait a minute, Jackson. Just hold it a minute. You've got it all wrong. That part had nothing to do with drinking. They needed someone who could play the part of a nightclub owner, a gambler, a great lover. A great lover, huh? Well, Phil, let me ask you something. If you're such a great lover, how come at the end of the picture, Victor Mature marries Betty Grable? Because Alice made him change the finish. (laughs) Alice? She ain't sharing me with nobody, even in the land of (laughs) make-believe. Phil, you're the hammiest guy I ever met. 
Oui, mon capitaine. I'm glad you agree. Now, kids, let's... Hello, Jack. Hi, you fellas. Well, Mary, welcome back. Hiya, Liv. Good to see you again. We sure missed you, Mary. Well, thanks, fellas. And Jack, next time I have a cold, don't send your doctor to take care of me. Why not? He's an excellent physician. Yeah, but boy, is he nearsighted. The doctor? When he came into the house, I thought I'd save a little time. So I stuck out my tongue and he hung his hat on it. <laughs> no kidding. Is he that nearsighted? Worse than that. Yeah? He went to listen to my chest, put his stethoscope against the radiator, yeah. and said, Stop hissing me. I'm here to help you. <laughs> had a little trouble with stethoscope. Yes, I did. <laughs> Next time we do the joke, we'll make it needle. <laughs> But anyway, Mary, I can tell by the twinkle in your eye that never happened. We oui, mon Capitan. I thought so. Well, anyway, you're back on the program. That's all that matters. Hey, Livo, how'd you happen to catch that coal in the first place? Well, one night I went out riding with Jack, and his car has no windshield. No windshield? Well, how come Jack didn't catch coal, too? He sits on the floor and drives by periscope. <laughs> drives by periscope. Drives by periscope. Stop making things up. Now, come on, Dennis. Uh, let's have your song. No. <laughs> What? I don't want to sing yet. I've only had three laughs up to now. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake, Dennis. Who counts their laughs? Phil does. Phil counts his laughs? As soon as he gets five, he runs over to NBC. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis, you yourself said I've only got one show. Let me keep it, will you? Now go ahead and sing. Well, how about my other two laughs? Never mind. <laughs> sing. <laughs> I do anything for you, anything you want me to. All I want is kissing you and music, music, music. Closer, my dear, come closer. The nicest part of any melody is when you're dancing close to me. Put another nickel in, in the Nickelodeon. All I want is loving you and music. Music, 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 sung by Dennis, Dennis, Dennis. <laughs> and very good. Daddy says once. We oui, mon Capitan. And now, ladies and gentlemen, as we mentioned before, it is only a few more days to the presentation of the Academy Awards. The leading male nominees for their outstanding performances are Broderick Crawford for All the King's Men, Richard Todd for The Hasty Heart, Gregory Peck for 12 O'Clock High, John Wayne for The Sands of Iwo Jima, and Jack Benny for his outstanding performance in The Champion. So tonight, we are going Jack. to... Jack, Jack, what are you talking about? Huh? Kirk Doug Douglas is up for the award. Well, he was the star of the back to stethoscope. Again. <laughs> I'll bet you $1,000 Douglas is easier to say than stethoscope. 
What did you, what'd you say, Dom? I said Kirk Douglas is up for the award. He was the star of the champion. Mary, that was for the picture. I'm talking about my radio performance. I did the champion on the radio a year ago. Well, who's going to give an award for that? I don't know, Mary. I got one last week. Let's take a chance. <laughs> so tonight we're going to offer our new version of the champion, in which... Excuse me. Hello? Hello, champ. This is Rochester. <laughs> Hello, Rochester. What do you want? I finished packing your bags for your trip to Palm Springs. Oh, good, good. I want to leave right after the program tonight. You sure you got everything? Yes, sir. I packed your riding habit. Uh-huh. Your tennis racket. Uh-huh. Your golf clubs and a pick and shovel. A pick and shovel? You know how you are when you lose a ball. <laughs> Rochester, I may lose a ball once in a while, but I don't dig holes on a golf course. I don't know. Last year, they followed you around planting pots. Trees. <laughs> all right, all right. Now, Roger, I'll, I'll spend a lot of time in the sun, so you better pack my yellow shorts. You better not take the yellow ones, boss. They're full of moth holes. My yellow shorts? Oh, well, then pack my blue ones. Well, they're not back from the cleaners. Oh. Well, in that case, pack my black ones. You sold those to gorgeous Gussie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Well, I'll buy some at the Springs. Uh, by the way, boss, in case anyone wants to get in touch with you, where will you be staying? At the beautiful Flamingo Hotel. But, Mr. Benny, the Flamingo Hotel isn't in Palm Springs, it's in Las Vegas. I know, but now when I do go to Las Vegas, I can stay there. <laughs> <laughs> now, Rochester, did you take care of everything else? Uh huh, I even packed your violin. What? You know, it's pretty crowded in Palm Springs. What's my violin got to do with it? Well, if you walk into a hotel and there's no vacancy, you can make one. <laughs> Did you think of that all by yourself? We, oui, mon capitaine. I thought so. Well, goodbye. So long, champ. And now... And now, ladies and gentlemen, for our feature attraction tonight, we're going to present oh, our Jack, new Jack, version. Jack. Our new... V uh, yes, Don? I, uh, I think we ought to get to the commercial end now before we do the play. Oh, yes. I'm glad you remind me. What has the sportsman quartet prepared? Well, they have a wonderful number, Jack, and they're dedicating it to you. To me? Yes, you see, Jack, there's such excitement about the Academy Awards that they feel terrible that you've stopped making pictures. No. Yes, they think that a star of your magnitude should project his personality in every possible medium. Well, and so they're dedicating this number to me? Yes, yeah, take it, boys. <laughs> Me? You ought to be in pictures For you're as cute as can be Gee. You're handsomer than Gable You're sexier than Flynn No Your legs are just like Grable's Please tell us, Jack, where you been? Your eyes are as soft and blue as the waters of Lake Louise. Your hair is a work of art, but please don't lose it in the breeze. You're funnier than Popeye. I am. You'd fill up every house. You ought to be in pictures like me. Mouse, you ought to make a picture with LSMFT. They're now in television, they're dancing so gracefully. They never seem to worry, they're never out of step. They learn from Arthur Murray, that's why they're hep, full of pep. They're so round, so firm, so fully packed, there's not a puff that's rough. We smoked them for nigh on twenty years, they are the ones we love. Love? They ought to win an Oscar. 
for smoking that is grand. So keep on buying luckies, your favorite brand. <laughs> Good boy, Don, that was really wonderful. And now, for our play. Take it, Don. Ladies and gentlemen, for our feature attraction tonight, we present our new version of that thrilling, dramatic story of the prize ring entitled The Champion. Curtain. Music. <laughs> Midge Benny. I'm the middleweight champion of the world. People say I'm a heel. They say I'd slug my own grandmother. But they're wrong. Grandma's a heavyweight. <laughs> my struggle to the championship was a tough one. It started two years ago. I was trudging along a dusty Kansas road hitchhiking with my best friend, Bubbles. You tired, Bubbles? Pretty much, Midge. Well, we'll be in Los Angeles in a few days. I hear it's a great place. There's a lot of smog there. Smog? What's that? That's fog with a garlic breath. <laughs> anyway, it won't be long now. As soon as we get there... Hey, Bubbles, look out. Here comes a car. Hello, boys. Do you want a lift? The car stopped in front of us the latest model driven by a beautiful girl with a convertible top. <laughs> I could tell by the dark part in her blonde hair that, that she had just converted it. <laughs> there was a man sitting next to her. As Bubbles and I started to get into the car, she said, Hop into the back seat, boys. Thanks, Thanks a lot. How far are you boys gone? All the way to Los Angeles. Los Angeles, eh? I got an aunt who lives in a suburb of Los Angeles. Glendale? No, Tehachapi. <laughs> now, by the way, miss, your boyfriend doesn't seem very talkative. He talks with his fists. He's Slugger Brown, the middleweight champ of the world. Yeah. <laughs> We can only take you boys as far as Omaha. Slugger's fighting there tonight. Yeah. Are you really Slugger Brown? Yeah. And you're... you're the middleweight champ? Yeah. And you're fighting tonight in Omaha? Yeah. Thirty-six years later, we arrived in Omaha. <laughs> the ride, I found out a lot about Slugger and his girlfriend, Flamingo. Her name used to be Mary, but she wanted a free week there, too. <laughs> I watched the fight that night and saw Slugger Brown collect 30,000 bucks. It was then I, Midge Benny, decided to become a prize fighter. Bubbles and I hitchhiked to Los Angeles. I went to see the foremost fight manager in town. I stripped myself to the waist. He looked at my chest and said, That reminds me, I'm having spare ribs for dinner. <laughs> now, don't be funny, Mr. McNully. I may not look so good now, see, but you give me two or three months of training and I'll be a champion someday. A champion, do you hear? No, wait a minute, me boy. Fighting is a tough game. I used to be a fighter myself. You? Right you are, me boy. I'll never forget me last fight. It was with Killer Nelson. I was afraid of him, but they made me go in the ring and fight. They did, eh? Now that they did. First we were fighting in the center of the ring, and then up against the ropes. Then he kept after me and after me, and finally caught me in the wrong corner and knocked me out. What corner was that? Pico and Sepulveda. <laughs> Pico and Sepulveda. The fight was held in New Orleans. <laughs> now, who else did you fight? Well, the most exciting fight I ever had was the one with Joe Lewis. You? You fought Joe Lewis? Ah, oh, he murdered me. <laughs> well, why did you fight him? I 
one to chance on a quiz program. <laughs> that? And eight glorious weeks in the Cedars of Lebanon Hospital. <laughs> Well, look, Mr. McNally, that don't discourage me. I want to be a fighter. Will you handle me? All right, me bucko. I'll be your manager. Now go over to the gym and let me train her. Punchy McNeil get you into condition. The next morning, I went over to the gym. It was a large, uh, gloomy place smelling a liniment. Here, in this edifice of concrete and steel, men dedicated their lives to the inhuman pursuit of mangling and maiming. It was here that the beast and man overrode all human qualities. And one man would try to pummel another's countenance beyond recognition for the sake of monetary reward. The preceding speech was written by William Paley, Jr. He not only made me hire his son, but I had to give him credit yet. I looked around the gym trying to find Punchy McNeil. Finally, I asked a man leaning against the ring. Excuse me, mister, but I'm looking for a Punchy McNeil. Ah, uh, that's me. <laughs> Well, I'm Midge Benny I'm pleased to know you <laughs> Now look, Punchy I'm trying to be a fighter And Mr. McNulty wants you to train me Okay, but you ought to think it over Fighting is a tough racket I should know because I used to be a fighter myself <laughs> No Yeah, I had my first fight back in 1932 Gosh Yeah, I spent 12 years in the ring Twelve years? Yeah, but I finally came to, got up, and went home. <laughs> well, look, Punchy, I now, want... wait a minute. I didn't finish my story. Oh, there's more? Yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, tell me, Punchy, were you always a fighter? Oh, no, I used to be a musician with Guy Lombardo's band. Go on, you were never with Lombardo. Oh, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, I was. <laughs> On that last sniff, he vacuumed the handkerchief right out of my vest pocket. Oh, come on, Mitch, let's start training. Two weeks later, I won my first fight. A full week later, my second. Then my third, fourth, and fifth, until I had won 28 fights. In two short years, I was matched to fight the champ, Slugger Brown. I was in my dressing room with my manager when the door opened. Hello, Midge. How you doing? It was her again. <laughs> she was wearing a sweatshirt that had Flamingo Hotel written on it. <laughs> this was overdoing it. <laughs> I walked over to her and said, Hello, baby. What brings you here? Well, I heard you were gonna fight the champ, and I wanted to see if you're ready for the main event. Well, sure I'm ready. Well, if you want to, you can kiss me for luck. Okay, here. <laughs> hmm, still a preliminary boy. <laughs> oh, yeah? Now, look, baby, how about a date tonight after I knock out the champ? I've got news for you, Midge. You're not knocking out anybody. You're throwing the fight. Are you kidding? If you don't believe me, here's your manager. Ask him. McNally, are you crazy? Would I fight for two years in tank towns for this? Would I spend two years getting my brains knocked out just so I could take a dive? Would I work my way up to title bow just to throw the fight? Would I? Would I? Why don't you turn the page and find out? <laughs> Why don't you turn the page and find out? I turned the page and there it was. I was to take a dive in the fifth round. William Paley Jr. double-crossed me. Well, I wasn't going to do it. I'd worked and fought to be champion, and tonight I was going to fight to win. Introducing at 159 pounds, the middleweight champion of the world, Slugger Brown! The Slugger is wearing purple trunks. And now for his worthy challenger, weighing 155 pounds, Midge Abene! Midge is wearing black shorts. They were too big for Gussie. 
And now for your sports announcer. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the radio audience. The men are in the center of the ring receiving their instructions. They go back to their corners waiting for the bell. And there it is, round one. Slugger comes out of his corner and starts mixing furiously. Midge meets him like a wildcat with a right and a left. And now for a few words from our sponsor, the Sagebrush Soap Company. <laughs> Look clean, feel clean, be clean. And remember our slogan, now is the hour to take a shower <laughs> while the bloom is on the sage. <laughs> now back to the fight. Well, that was an exciting round. <laughs> Slugger's nose is still bleeding and Midge's eye is tightly closed. Now we're waiting for the bell for the second round. There's the bell. The boys come out and circle each other. They're still circling each other. We circled each other three times. Then my opponent leaned over to me and said... Hey, Bud. Bud. Who, me? Yeah. Come here a minute. What is it? What round are you going to take the dive in? The fifth. Uh-uh. What? Make it the third. The third? Why? My feet are killing me. Now well, look, Slugger, I'm not throwing this fight. I'm in here to win, so start mixing it. Do you understand? We, oui, Mon Capitan. Okay, put up your dukes. Ooh! The champ lands a terrific right cross, and Mitch Benny is down. Yes, I was down. The referee is counting over him. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, ten. <laughs> the referee was a tobacco auctioneer. <laughs> As I lay there, beaten and dazed, my whole career flashed in front of me. How it started two years ago, when I was trudging along a dusty Kansas road, Hitchhiking with my best friend, Bubbles. You tired, Bubbles? Pretty much, Midge. Hey, Bubbles, look out. Here comes a car. Hello, boys. You want a lift? Oh, no. We're not going through that again. Come on, Bubbles. <laughs> Jack, we'll be back in just a moment, but first... Six tables. Scientific tests prove Lucky Strike is milder than any other principal brand of cigarettes. Scientific tests prove Lucky Strike is milder than any other principal brand of cigarettes. That fact is verified by an independent consulting laboratory with more than 15 years' experience in cigarette research. The report from the consulting laboratory stated... Based on our analytical findings, it is our opinion that Lucky Strike cigarettes are the mildest of the six major brands tested. L-S-M-F-T. L-S-M-F-T. Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. Fine, light, naturally mild tobacco that the makers of Lucky Strike consistently select and buy. Just listen to the words of Mr. B.V. Bowen, an independent tobacco buyer from Timminsville, South Carolina. Recently, he said... I've been in the tobacco business for 40 years, and year after year, I've seen the makers of Lucky Strike buy fine, light, ripe tobacco that makes a smooth, mild smoke. I've smoked Luckies for 22 years. So, smoke a Lucky. You'll prove to yourself what scientific tests prove. Lucky Strike is milder than any other principal brand of cigarettes. Let your own taste and throat be the judge. For smoothness and mildness, there's never a rough puff in a lucky strike. So round, so firm, so fully packed, so free and easy on the draw. Ladies and gentlemen, next week at the same time, our program will be coming to you from Palm Springs, and our guest will be Bob Hope. So be sure and... Come in. Mr. Benny? Yes? Here's a telegram for you. Right here, boy. Here's a tip. Jeez, thanks. Now I can spend the rest of my life working. <laughs> hmm. Who's the wire from, Jack? Let's see. Oh, it's from Bob Hope. Now, isn't this clever? Well, what does he say? Dear Jack, happy to be on your program next week in Palm Springs, but I must warn you, as soon as I get five laughs, I'm going out and play golf. <laughs> Gee, everybody counts. <laughs> Good night, folks. Be sure to hear Dennis Day and the day in the life of Dennis Day. Stay tuned for the Amos Man who follows immediately. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>